My name is Martin Bjornsson and I'm a technical specialist at Advenica. And I'm going to talk about Advenica data diodes and zone guards. Uh, feel free to post your questions in the chat and I will try to answer them uh, after the presentation. So let's start with the, the diodes. Um, data diodes allow data to flow in one direction and one direction only. Not a single bit of information can possibly pass through the device in the wrong direction. This one-way transfer of information is achieved using optical hardware and there's no soft configuration that can possibly override this very strict unidirectional data flow. So there's no way a human error can, uh, can possibly compromise the, the one-wayness of the, of the device. Diodes can help you to transfer information between systems even though you have requirements on physical and logical separation. And this is due to the fact that data diodes do not actually connect the systems in the wrong direction, but only in the, in the direction which, in which data is allowed to, to flow. Uh, these boxes are the current lineup of Advenica diodes. We have a smaller one on the top which is suited to be mounted on a Dean rail. We have a medium sized one and a full 19 inch device with built in proxy servers, which are required if you want to handle traffic and protocols that are not inherently one way. We also have a Swedish N3 approval on the medium sized one and on the large device. Uh, and N3 is the highest level of assurance that there are on diodes today. And we are actually the only supplier with approvals on that level. So now let's go through a couple of typical use cases using diodes. And the first one out is unidirectional logging. So, um, Centralized monitoring and logging is a very important piece of the puzzle when it comes to a secure IT or OT environment. Now, let's imagine that you have a business network or an office IT network and a couple of OT, OT environments uh, that we want to connect to an audit zone or an audit network. Uh, this could, for example, be a security operations center and it could be managed by one of your subcontractors. Uh, by separating your networks from the audit zone using diodes, your sensitive networks remain isolated from each other. Um, there is no way that information start flowing between the networks through audit zones, since there's no way back from the audit zone. The SOC, cannot affect OT or IT environments. So an incident in the SOC or audit zone could of course reveal your logging information, but the integrity of your sensitive networks will remain intact. Also, an attacker that somehow has gotten into your environment will find it very difficult to erase or modify logs that have traversed the diodes to audit zone. So, the diodes protect your sensitive networks from each other and from the audit zone and from the SOC. Okay. Um, our next diode use case, which is also a challenge in OT environments, is software updates. Uh, so what I'm going to show you here is actually Windows updates, but the principle also works with Linux-based uh, systems, for example, Debian mirroring and other types of updates as well. Uh, if you have antivirus software with uh, antivirus signatures that has to be updated, you can use the same principle. Um, so the solution is based on having two different update servers in your system, one located outside of OT, and which is typically in the, in the IT environment, uh, or, a, or a DMC belonging to the IT environment, and another server located in the OT environment. Now, the server located in IT downloads 
update package from, in this case, Microsoft and stores them locally. At this point, there has to be some qualification or testing process in place for sorting out those packages that can and should be installed in OT. And the operator has to select those packages uh, that have been approved and the diode collects them and pushes them into OT to the update located in OT. The OT server verifies that the packages are correctly signed and the packages are now available in OT and systems there can now be updated. As you can see, the diode points in this case inwards OT and thereby prevents any attempts to communicate out from OT. For example, a solar winds type of attack would have had much less consequences with this type of setup since malware would not have had any possibility to communicate with its home server or send out sensitive or classified information. The last use case using diodes is going to be about replicating historian data, which is really data related to the OT process and how the process is performing. Um, and in this case, we want to export data out. So the diode is pointing into IT, allowing data to flow from OT into IT. And we have two databases here. One historian database, database located in OT that collects data from the processes monitored by the SCADA system. Uh, this data is then copied or replicated over the diode to the historian replica located in IT, where IT systems can read the data. So usually this is a read-only type of database. The diode prevents the IT environment from affecting OT, so the integrity of OT is preserved. Um, and this would actually also allow us to use cloud services for storage or for processing of, of process data. The diode would quite effectively prevent the cloud service from affecting the integrity of, of, of OT. Uh, now, note that if you combine this solution with another diode-based solution, with the diode pointing in the other direction, for example, the previous use case with software updates, you should have some kind of internal segmentation in OT between the systems that communicate through the diodes. Otherwise, you risk having a two-way communication between IT and OT, despite, uh, despite the diodes. And that was the last diode use case. And now we're moving on to the sound guard. Um, and the sound guard is a gateway for a controlled information exchange. Uh, as a network appliance, it is similar to an application proxy or an information exchange gateway, which is a, a NATO term for these types of devices. Uh, and the purpose with it is to monitor and control the information flow between different security domains. Compared to a data diode, this device allows two-way communication and it also has a filtering security mechanism. The SongGuard is at its core a security platform on which we can support different types of protocols and applications, um, such as uh, logging, uh, file transfer, email, uh, remote access using the RDP protocol, uh, various uh, database uh, related protocols and applications. Uh, this is just uh, naming a few. So now let's see what happens inside the zone guard and the number of steps that the information has to go through in order to pass from one side of the device to the other. So data is sent to the zone guard in packets and packets are accumulated until a complete email has been received. Let's assume that we're dealing with an email application here. Now that's already quite different from how many other security devices work, such as firewall, as they normally don't accumulate emails or files or whatever type of information 
you are transporting over your network. In the next step, the document, in this case, the email, is stored and separated from the protocols that carry the email over the network. So we, we get rid of all the other protocols and just keep the email. The content is then split into its components, like sender, receiver, body, and so on. And it's structured in a way that makes it easy for the filtering mechanism or policy engine, which is really the core of Sonar, uh, which makes it easier for the, for the policy engine to process these components, the different components. The structured components then enter the policy engine uh, and we can apply a rule set which is defined specifically for this installation. Um, we can, for example, verify that emails are only sent to specific receivers, uh, that the body does not contain any sensitive words or tags. Attachments can be removed or processed in different ways. The content is then sent to the data out side where it is reassembled divided into data packets again, and sent out on the network. So quite many steps and validation points to get the email from one side of the device to the other. Uh, so now I'm gonna go through uh, one use case using Songar as a security device. Uh, and this one is one of our latest additions of protocols supported by the Sonogar, ICCP or TACE2. So ICCP has been standardized by IEC and it's used for exchanging information between different power control centers. And the purpose with that is to coordinate these different systems for generation and distribution of power. These control centers are typically typically arranged in a, in a hierarchy, as you can see in the illustration, with uh, one or a couple of centers uh, in the middle. There are, however, some possible challenges with this. First of all, ICCP and the underlying protocol stack, which is also called the UTS stack, is quite complex. As you can see here, there are many layers of protocols, and these protocols are not that widely used in other applications. So the level of complexity is high, and the protocols are somewhat, let's say, exotic. Which leads us to the next challenge, that there are not that many different implementations of this protocol. So, uh, so vendors of systems that provide support for ICCP tend to use the same implementation. They all have the, the same third party source for the implementation. Uh, and these uh, homogeneous uh, environments are often considered more vulnerable since one bug or software vulnerability can be used for attacking all servers running this ICCP implementation. There is also, in some cases at least, I should say, a lack of boundary protection between the control centers. And that's, uh, among other things, that's due to, to the fact that this communication is usually not exposed to an open network, but rather um, on dedicated links. Or, and the organizations that, that run these control centers usually more or less trust each other. So they don't really recognize the fact that a breach somewhere in the network could spread to all sites without being slowed down or stopped by proper boundary protection. The ICCP servers are, as many other servers in IoT, not properly hardened or patched. And last but not least, the impact, if these networks are affected by an outsider, could be quite significant. So. In order to address these risks, we have developed a solution based on Songar as a boundary protection device. Uh, the device is installed in the ITOT boundary 
and processes all ICCP traffic going in and going out of OT. Our implementation of ICCP has no relations to other implementations and it's also developed with security in focus from the beginning. So an exposed vulnerability in one of the other commonly used implementations should not also be exploitable in the SongGuard. As I showed you in the animation on SongGuard technology, ICCP messages are split, filtered and reassembled as part of this strategy to handle threats and vulnerabilities. And this solution would detect and report any traffic that does not fit the specifications and trigger an alarm that a SOC or a similar task force should be able to act upon. ICCP traffic can also be filtered according to an organization specific policy, which would assure that only proper measurement data or other ICCP contents is allowed to enter and exit the OT environment. And that's what I had planned for this session, and I'm ready to take any questions that you may have. Mm, yes, yes Petra Petra here. Here. there are no written questions at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, if somebody, somebody has, has a question. question. The question, the question is, is why, why is not the high enough? Um, yeah, sorry for the uh, sound um, mistake here, sorry, but I think you should hear me now. Uh, why is not a firewall enough, is the question. Uh, well, I mean, firewalls are enough in some cases, uh, but if you require uh, security at the level uh, which we usually deliver, if you're talking uh, diodes or filters, we sort of, uh, we're sort of the next step. If, if firewalls aren't aren't enough and that that usually you know that depends on what kind of opponents you have uh, the level of risks uh, you are subject to mm -hmm. and if you want to defend yourself against foreign powers with pretty much uh, infinitely of, of resources uh, and, and and knowledge then at least one firewall is usually not enough you have to have something else. You have to have multiple firewalls or you have to have uh, like the SongGuard information exchange gateways. Diodes are really effective in the in the one wayness uh, in, in the one wayness of the of the diode. So depending on the threat and the risks, you, you sometimes you need something more than a firewall. Yes. Okay. And there is a question, is there or how big is the delay when processing of a uh, packet? In the SongGuard, uh, we, okay. do, we do add delays. So um, some applications are not suitable to go, uh, for going through a SongGuard or similar devices since we have to, to break, down, uh, break down every packet. We try to accumulate as much as we can and then send it through the, like I presented the policy engine or the, the core of the SongGuard. So that kind of mitigates some of those uh, challenges. Um, we can handle approximately a thousand packets per second, so which is enough for most applications. But there are some real-time type of types of applications that are not suitable for that kind of, uh, kind of technology. We're very good at processing large chunks of data like file transfers. Uh, in those types of applications, uh, the zone guard is really effective. But if you want to handle small packets with high frequency, then then uh, you, you, you know, sometimes you have to think of other types of solutions. Okay, thank you. Then I have a, there's another question from your perspective. Is it possible to implement? Uh, dyer or filter without significant cooperation with SCADA systems vendor? Um, yes, that is in some, depending on the system, of course. Um, 
we had one use case here in the in the presentation with the database replication. Sometimes you're able to replicate, pull out the data and uh, send it over the diode and create a copy of that database uh, in the DMC outside of OT without uh, affecting uh, the SCADA system. Uh, you're sort of you're creating a copy and you're telling the system to go to that copy instead it, but the system doesn't really know that it is a copy it, it believes it's the original um, but of course you have to look at the different uh, systems and, and cases it's it's difficult to say in, in general okay there was another question of what is whitelisting is that used why whitelisting is used what is whitelisting? Why, what, is is whitelisting? Okay. Uh, what is whitelisting? Okay. What is whitelisting? Whitelisting is a list of uh, known good. Let's say known good, and that's the only uh, pieces of information that you're going to let through the device that you're going to allow pass to pass through the device instead of blacklisting, where you list known bads. So. Uh, you list everything that's good and you block everything else. And that way you can handle threats that are at the point when you define the whitelist unknown to you. So that's usually a more effective long-term strategy to handle threats. Yes. Okay, thank you, uh, Martin. Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation about our dias and songas and use cases with them. And, and now we're going to hand over to a new presenter, which is George. Hello. Can everybody hear me okay? Welcome, George. Okay. Can you see now the presentation? Sorry. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear and we can see you. Thank you. Yes. Perfect. And the screen is the one with the presentation, right? Okay. Perfect. Um, I'd like to start by thanking everyone, uh, everyone who attended um, the well, the previous sessions. I think there's a good segue to what I'm going to present today, and um, just to kind of like start with this. My name is George Kerekesh. I uh, work at a company called Opsot. Uh, we're partnering with uh, Advenica uh, in this data transfer process between networks. I am managing the EMEA uh, sales engineering team for Opsot. And uh, since I mentioned Opsot a couple of times, I'll take the chance to actually tell you who Opsot is. Uh, some of you might not be aware of uh, Opsot. So essentially, we're a cybersecurity company that has been founded, founded back in 2002 in San Francisco. Um, now we have nine global offices with almost 400 employees around the world. Uh, so it's through global company. And what we try to do is to protect the world's critical infrastructure with a, a philosophy that says trust no file, trust no device. So um, we're a zero trust company, even, even though this became a cliche now, um, but we were a zero trust company before this was a thing. What I want to, to talk about today is the need of security, and I'm sure we all know why security is needed. Um, what's the opposite solution for that? And have a chance to uh, take the chance to show you a quick live demo, uh, because I, I'm, I'm really uh, I do think live demo is, is the best way to, to speak about a technology. So in terms of what the needs are, uh, we're obviously, we've heard, um, we've heard uh, in the previous sessions about the hyper convergence of the two uh, main networks, IT and OT, um, and, and different ways to connect the two of them. Um, it's very difficult to still find a true air gap network, which is truly disconnected from the other network. And that's for, you know, uh, business reasons and operations reasons. 
So there's the continuous debate of, of the, you know, what triads should be applied or, or what triads should take precedence in that network. Obviously, you know, um, confidentiality, integrity, and availability are uh, the main three pillars in, in those networks. It's the order that's, that's important and that's the one that causes friction between, let's call them OT people and IT people. Uh, there is a way to get to a middle ground with technology uh, which is which is uh, you know very very uh, uh, very good. So companies should be, or uh, different organizations are um, forced, let's say, to be compliant with specific regulations depending on their industry. And since we're talking uh, operation technology, uh, we're looking at critical infrastructure. So depending on on you know the the territory or the country they operate, they might be subject to compliance uh, regulations like NERC-SIP or NEI or NIS if we're talking Europe. Right? Uh, those have several core requirements, all of them, right? Uh, uh, the way to transfer data between low to high or IT to OT is usually using transient devices. So we include here all kinds of portable media, you know, USB, CDs, uh, floppy disks, even and uh, even even laptops. So there's a, obviously a need to make sure the data that gets transferred between or over the air gap, it's uh, it's clean. So there's ways to do that uh, in in isolated environments. Uh, it, it's it becomes a bit challenging where we cannot use a diode. Uh, then you know it's essentially jumping over the air gap. Uh, usually using uh, storage device, portable storage devices that are encrypted. So uh, the file processing and remediation is uh, a bit more challenging, but it's still doable. There's obviously a need to implement uh, robust workflows and enough access controls. So the security team is um, is you know can 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 sleep at night uh, knowing the data moving from IT to OT. And then when we're looking at, you know, um, the recent attacks and this first almost half of, of, of this year uh, was all about supply chain protection and supply chain attacks. Uh, it's probably more important than it ever was. Um, and it's not only in, I, in, in OT environments, it's now uh, very, uh, in the spotlight on this, it's on the IT environment also. Uh, that's obviously going to affect the reputation of, of businesses if there's no enough security controls to protect against supply chain attacks. Um, there's there's probably no cybersecurity solution out there that can provide 100% guarantee they would be able to stop the, the supply chain attack. But at least from an organization standpoint, um, you know, there it it would be. Let's, hope, let's call it, um, it would be good to implement enough security controls to make it uh, as difficult as possible for a threat actor to actually uh, choose choose that way uh, to attack a company. So knowing this, and, and I, I didn't choose to present what's the, you know, what's the threat landscape. It's been presented very well in the beginning of, of the webinar. We all know what the, the, what the danger is uh, and we, we just, have to focus on how to prevent this to happen to, to, to our organization essentially. And also it comes to help with a platform called Meta Defender. And this platform, uh, I, I personally call it a defense in depth software. And reason for that is because in this one software, we combine multiple technologies to make sure the files that get transferred from one network to another are clean. So it's all about file security. What technologies we use to make sure files are clean? Well, the first and most important one is the multi-scanning. As you can probably uh, tell by the name of the technology, it's essentially combining multiple antivirus, uh, antivirus engines together to scan files at the same time. So as the file move fr moves from low to high or high to low, we can use up to 35, so that's three, five, AV vendors to scan the file at the same time, making sure there's no 
uh, malware in, in that, uh, in that uh, file. Now, the benefits of doing that, I guess, you know, it's, uh, they're, they're obvious for, for all of us. Um, increased detection rate, uh, the more engines you add, the, the more malware you're able to detect, but also you're, you're going to be able to detect it quicker. So quicker reaction to outbreaks. Uh, and also spreading the risk, uh, essentially not relying on one or two AD vendors to make sure uh, the files that get into that most critical network are uh, secure, you're spreading that risk ac across 35 of them. But since this is the detection-based technology, like any detection-based technology, it has a limitation, right? And when I say detection-based technology, I'm, I'm, I'm referring to anything that's, you know, AV, sandbox, IDS, IPS, you name it. Um, there's still zero days out there for a reason. Uh, so knowing this, uh, this limitation, we somehow enhance uh, the, the capability of the platform with a different technology uh, which is at the other end of, of how this works. Essentially, it's a, we call it deep CDR, content disarmament reconstruction. So when you have contractors trying to transfer all kind of uh, user guides or all kind of productivity files into that network, which doesn't happen uh, as much as it happens transferring binaries, but it still happens. And we see in the news, um, you know, attacks that leverage uh, malicious macros and, and things like that to get a foothold in that in that network. Uh, this is where deep CDR comes into play. Being a pure prevention technology takes a zero trust approach to file security, removing all the objects that can be weaponized and creating a new file out of it. So we have multi-scanning, we have deep CDR, so uh, detection and prevention uh, working together. Uh, we also have the ability to detect if there's any sensitive, uh, sorry, if there's any, uh, any known vulnerability in that file, if it's a binary or an application installer. And we, we can also check if there's any sensitive information in the files that get transferred mostly out of the, the air gap. So those are the four main technologies, multi-scanning, deep CDR, uh, vulnerability assessment, and proactive DLP. Now, I'm um, just gonna skip through some of those, but obviously the system, it's a, it's a, it's a software, runs on a virtual machine, get, gets deployed uh, on premise. There's no connection to the cloud. It runs in air gap environments. Actually, most of our deployments run in air gap environments. And there's a, there's a process on how to update the AV definitions in an offline environment. We provide a free tool for that and it can be automated if there's a data that can transfer the files uh, where the system uh, uh, resides. And in terms of what's happening in the system when we scan a file, you can see this on the, on the slide here. Those are essentially uh, the technologies that work in the back end, making sure the file, file is clean. So the file gets to the system, the first thing we do is a, is a true file type verification. We're not relying on file type extension to make sure the file is of, of that type. We look inside the file for magic number headers to determine the exact file type. So spoofed files cannot uh, move to, to the next step. Uh, after that, we do extract the files. Uh, we support over 40 different uh, our compressed file types. We would extract everything and every individual object goes through multi-scanning where it gets scanned again with up to 35 AV engines. We check if there's any vulnerability, any known vulnerability, and we'll show the list of CVs associated with that uh, specific uh, software, software version, or binary. We would de-weaponize the file if it's uh, one of the 113 supported file types for sanitization. And again, that includes productivity file, uh, office office documents, PDF, images, audio files, uh, emails, archives, and so on. Um, also CAD, AutoCAD files, which are also also very uh, used in, in those type of environments. Uh, lastly, we can check if, we can check if there's any sensitive information in that file and create a, a clean file out of it, which is the one that's used in in that network. Now, how does that look in reality, right? What's the process for doing that? And what, what are the, uh, the products that we use to implement this uh, technology? So in this very simple diagram, we try to include you know, the different options that, that would exist in terms of transferring data. 
So obviously on the left, we have the unsecured network or the IT or the DMZ of that uh, OT environment where we have the Opsat kiosk. Kiosk is, uh, you can think of it as an ATM machine. Uh, it does come in different form factors. It, it can be a smaller uh, version of that hardware, but it's a portable media checkpoint essentially. Um, you have a contractor coming uh, to transfer some data into the, the OT environment or any, any one that has to transfer data into the OT environment. Could be the sysadmins transferring patches uh, for, for the operating systems. We scan, the, we, we plug in the USB or, or that external hard drive. We process everything with the technologies I mentioned and that workflow in that sequence using multi-scanning CDR and so on. And then we choose how the files get transferred on, on the high side, depending on the connection that exists between the two networks. Uh, if we're looking uh, at the, the lower side here, if, there's a, if there is an, a diode, and we do work with the Benica from that standpoint, um, we would transfer the data one way from low to high, only the clean data. When we store the data on an Opsat solution, on a different Opsat solution called MetaDefender Vault, as the name says, it's a file vault. Files get transferred there, they get stored, with a web browser, you just connect to that Vault VM and download the files where you need them to use. So by just implementing this, you have the chance to completely block USB access for the users in that network. So essentially, all the data gets transferred to the Vault machine, stays there, USB ports get blocked. The only way to get data uh, is to just go open a web browser on the target machine, download the files and use them. Obviously the benefit of doing that is a better control of this transfer process and a full audit trail. But situation is not as simple as that. And uh, we'll, we are aware of that. There's still a need to use USBs or to allow USBs to be used on specific workstations. Uh, and we can work on a combination of this uh, deployments where we can use Vault uh, and specific workstations that still need USB access would run an Opsat agent. And that Opsat agent, it's essentially a very, uh, very, very light uh, agent, that endpoint agent that runs on that machine. And what it does, it simply makes sure no USB that hasn't been scanned in the kiosk is allowed to be used. So if uh, I try to sneak in a USB past the kiosk and plug it into the workstation where the agent runs, I'm not gonna be able to use it. The only way to use the USBs on that workstation is to scan it in the kiosk in a time frame, um, that lasts 24 hours, uh, and have that signed, and the data has to obviously be clean, but also data has to be uh, not modified after the scan session. So if I try to add some new files after I scan it in the kiosk, again, I will get a pop-up saying, you have to go back to the kiosk and scan that again. Uh, and the last uh, use case uh, and the last flavor of the implementation is when we need to use USBs on SCADA and HMI machines where there's no option to install anything, right? Vendors sometimes don't allow um, you as a customer to install software on their equipment because it would break the warranty or they would say it's not supported or it needs a specific certification. Um, for this, there is a solution and you can see it here on the, on the, uh, on the uh, upper side, it's called MetaDefender Firewall. It's essentially a small uh, hardware box which becomes the USB interface for that machine. And that's where you plug the USB and the USB firewall can do something similar to the agent that's installed on the endpoint. So essentially making sure that USB has gone through the scanning process in the kiosk. And if it hasn't, it will not allow the USB to, or the data to be transferred to that say PLC machine to be configured. So obviously uh, the, the deployment can be much more complex and it usually is in very big facilities uh, Opsat has an extensive experience in deploying this since we we have this deployed in 98% of the nuclear power plants in the US and uh, a very big customer base in, uh, in critical infrastructure 
in Europe also, uh, Sweden included, obviously. So there, there's enough knowledge on how this gets implemented and we can, uh, we can work with you on how this would best be applied to your network if there's interest of that. Uh, long story short, I'm just going to switch now and show you um, the demo part. So I'm just going to minimize this and bring the kiosk UI. So that's what the users would see when they approach that kiosk software. That's the end user experience. Um, I have here a USB with me and I will use this USB to scan it. So uh, obviously this is uh, this is a demo version of the software. The software that runs in production will take over the machine. Uh, there's no way to access the operating system of that machine. So you can even um, leave this in, an, in a place uh, where there's no one to actually look after the machine. So like a reception where there's maybe no receptionist. Um, so there's an option to also choose the language, of course, and an option to customize the UI to make it look like your own. Uh, so I'm just going to say begin, and uh, now I'm presented with two two screens, right? A screen that would allow me to use the kiosk as a guest. If I'm a contractor, I don't have any AD account um, in your network, and also a screen that allows me to use it as an employee. So by integrating with Active Directory, uh, we can authenticate users, or even uh, we we even provide a DLL that allows you as a customer to connect uh, your batch scanner uh, to, to the kiosk. We would just usually place a small batch reader on the kiosk and the, the employees just tap it and they get authenticated. I'm just gonna use the guest uh, workflow because it's a bit more interesting in what it can do. And obviously there's a, there's a number of questions we would be able to enforce here because being a guest, I want to know what the destination of this the data is, who's maybe that guest, who's the contact person, and so on and so forth. Uh, all those questions and answers are obviously part of a report, which is generated at the end of the scan session. So in my case, I'm just going to say the, the target machine is PLC number one. Then I'll just take the USB and plug it. As you can see on the screen, there's different, uh, there's different portable media that are supported, anything that's mass storage plus CD and DVD, even mobile phones are supported. Most of the screens that you see in this process are configurable. So if I'm an admin and I want to keep the process for guests as simple as start, plug the USB, data gets transferred, I can do that. Um, here, I just want to show the different options that exist. I have the option to browse through my USB or to process everything. I'm just gonna go to browse just because I want to show you uh, essentially the number of files and I would select everything. And that means I'm scanning all the files plus the boot sector of this drive, uh, which is sometimes ignored by, um, by security solutions, but boot sector can obviously host rootkits. Uh, so it's very important to also scan that one. Um, now the files get scanned. In my case, they, they get scanned with eight different antivirus engines. We check for vulnerabilities and we de-weaponize the files here. And you can, as an end user, you can see the progress of this on the screen. Um, there's obviously a sound that comes up when we detect something bad. Even that sound can be customized with the sound that you prefer. Um, when we have to deal with uh, more complex files or bigger files, obviously the process would take a bit longer. And here, as an end user, if I want to see what files have been blocked, and I see three files have been blocked in my case, two of them are infected, and I can usually you know, choose a touch screen, and I will just uh, use the touch screen to go and navigate through this. In my case, I'm just gonna use the mouse, and, and I get some information about the file, obviously the hash and the AD engines that mark this file is infected. Now in my case, like I said, I'm using eight different AD engines and you see, you only see the ones that were able to detect this file as being affected. Again, showing why multi scanning is important. Here for this, for, for this example, I get a 50% detection rate. Uh, you get a threat name for, from every vendor. 
the threat name here shows me this is actually an exploit that has a vulnerability or CV attached from 2018. So it's a, it's a three years old exploit that's still able to bypass some of those uh, AD vendors. Like that's why multi-scanning is so important. If I were to rely on one of them, there's a high chance I would accept this in my network. And lastly, uh, this is a MicroTik router patch. Um, essentially, this one has known vulnerabilities, uh, critical ones even, so remote code execution and buffer overflow. If I were to accept this to patch a networking device in my network, that would be that would be great. Uh, so I have five allowed files, um, and what's going to happen? Uh, some of the blocked files would be de-weaponized, so we would remove the malicious macros in those, and I can choose to transfer. Now the data transfer from the kiosk to the vault, like I said, can be done through a data diode. Now the files get transferred to the vault server. Remember, I started the session as a guest, so I have no account in that company. Uh, now what's going to happen is the kiosk will transfer the files for me and it's going to create a temporary guest account. And that guest account can be printed on a piece of paper by the kiosk. And that allows me to just take the piece of paper, leave all the portable media in that reception area, presumably, and with a, with a piece of paper, go and retrieve the files. And that's exactly what you see here. Now my network is a bit slow. In transferring this, uh, it's usually not going to be uh, like you see here. Now, this temporary account is just a code, right? I would have the piece of paper. Now, let's imagine I'm jumping the air gap and I'm in the OT network. I go and visit my contact, I give them the piece of paper with this code. Uh, they would go to the Meta Defender Core, uh, sorry, to the Meta Defender Vault server to retrieve the files for me. So if I bring back this diagram quickly, we scan the files here, we transfer them, I'm in the OT network, the files are on the Meta Defender vault. I have the piece of paper, I'm a guest, I give it to someone uh, that's part of the organization, and what they would do is they would take the piece of paper and insert the code. Right, I'm just going to say access files. And obviously this is, I'm going to change the, the language here. Uh, both kiosk and the vault support uh, different languages, as you can see here. In my case, this is set in German, and I, I obviously have the, the option to change it here. Now what happened, the files, are part of an archive, which I can download, and now I can use the files on that machine where I need them to. In terms of scanning, you see the files have been scanned with multiple AV engines, but they were also sanitized. The list of AV engines here, uh, you can see them here, the, the list of files. And now, what's very important is once the files are stored in this network, there's for some files, there's a need to keep them in that network. Storing them in the vault gives you the advantage of continuously reassessing the security of those files by continuous scanning. So as an admin of the vault, with just a flip of a button, I can say, I want the files that are stored in the vault to be scanned on a regular intervals. That gives me the option to potentially stop an outbreak you know, if it, if there's a zero day, let's let's say let's imagine there's a zero day that managed to evade all detections and it's part of a binary, so we cannot sanitize it. It's in the vault. AV vendors would would uh, up their game. They would release a signature um, in day one. Let's say you do update the AV engines in day one by just implementing this continuous scanning mechanism. Uh, you're able to detect that, block access to the file the audit log would allow you to see all the users and the IPs that previously uh, downloaded the file. And then, um, you know, going one step further with the security orchestration software integration, uh, because Meta Defender uh, Vault supports API, so the integration would be quite simple. You can then automate this uh, like a playbook, essentially. 
So that's the benefit of using the combination of solutions that I presented. Um, and that was my presentation and demo. I do hope it was informative and it was interesting. If there's any questions, I would be very happy to answer them. Yes, thank you very much, you. Uh, George. Um, we don't have any questions written here now. Let's see if somebody has, uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Well, I hope that means everything was very clear. I have, yes, I have uh, one question here. How do you keep yes. the uh, antivirus engines updated? That's a great question, considering this gets deployed in OT environments where, where there's no uh, internet connection. So usually what we do with our customers is we provide a free tool that gets installed in the IT network, can get installed on a regular laptop, uh, or sysadmin desktop, uh, that tool downloads the necessary files and then we would transfer them through the diode if, uh, if say the platform resides on the high side or we just take, put them on a USB, plug the USB in the kiosk, scan them and then apply them. Um, so it can be an automated process if the network allows, if the, say the network technology allows or it could be a manual process. Thank you. And we have another question. Was the total amount of engines 35 a limit or can they be extended over time? Uh, it usually gets extended. Um, it goes up more, th more than it goes down. Uh, we had to remove one engine. We, we, one engine. we continuously uh, do assessment on performance and detection. And if we see it doesn't really perform the way we want, there's a chance we remove it. Um, that happens really rarely, but most of the times we add new engines and new engines would be added automatically to your license if you choose to go with the maximum uh, engine package, which we, that's how we call it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, George, uh, for sharing this uh, presentation about uh, your uh, what tools and oh there was another question are the engines specialized or public publicly available uh yes yes they are there's a there's a url i can share with everybody where the name of the engines and the packages we offer plus the detection rate for each engine is mentioned so i'm just going to paste that in the chat so you can so you can uh, you Great. can verify that Okay, thank you very much, uh, George. Uh, My pleasure. And we're thank moving you. on to our next speaker then, which is Mats. Welcome into the game here, Mats. There we go. Let's see. You should be able to share your presentation now. Does it work? We'll see. There you go. Yes, we see your presentation. Good. And we see you. Uh, go ahead. Perf perfect. So um, I'm going to propose to you that we uh, need less segmentation, which is perhaps not you'd, something you'd expect at the uh, Advenica event. But uh, don't worry, Petra, I'll, I'll come back to what I mean, really. Um, on our way towards lunch, I'll define what I mean by OT and IT and IoT. I'll compare OT security to information security and IT security. I'll offer at least two challenges that tend to get in the way uh, when we make technology initiatives and make them fail. And uh, I just might uh, hint at some um, solutions as well. Um, my name is Mats Karlsson Landre. I'm a security advisor with Atea in Sweden, in Västerås. Uh, I do uh, advisory work in OT security as well as IT security, information security, physical protection uh, in various sectors, manufacturing, healthcare, building management, uh, nuclear power, harbors, you name it. Uh, 
before coming to Atea, I spent most of my life as a IT security manager at a, a nuclear fuel manufacturing facility here in Vesteros. Uh, I've also been an IT manager within ABB and Westinghouse. Uh, and something that I brought with me from my time in nuclear is the importance of combining technology with human insights and uh, especially when we're doing security and safety work. Uh, for instance, establishing a, a no blame culture. Uh, since this is an OT security presentation, I need to have at least one slide that mentions Stuxnet and uh, here it is along with some uranium centrifuges. Uh, enjoy. Um, OT operational technology uh, it's a word that's becoming more and more common and it's replacing various uh, other and older words uh, and i think it's a good uh, step in many cases uh, we're going away from this uh, industry uh, related uh, wording and, and coming into that OT is in, in very, uh, very many uh, different areas of, of business. Um, I'll come back to IoT, which is a special uh, issue and a, a problem in some cases. So OT, uh, what is that? Uh, well, in the word operational, we understand that it's something operational, something physical. And it's something that we, in the old days, used manpower for or machines uh, in some way of, of managing a physical process. And uh, while keeping the process running, uh, we try to make sure nobody dies. Uh, we try to protect the environment and so on, which is different from IT, where we uh, manage information, of course. Uh, we used to do that. Uh, with paper on doing letters, finding people, construction of various types and, and managing money. These days we do uh, streaming music, e-commerce, remote work, uh, what have you. But it's always about information. It's information that's important. And uh, typically it's about keeping secrets. And I'll come back to, to this different in, in priorities. As I said, uh, OT is not only a classic industry, it's in uh, petrochemical, in, in building management, uh, chemical factories, uh, healthcare, uh, power generation and distribution, and of course, uh, various types of, of uh, manufacturing industries, uh, be it cars or uh, as in this case, a, a bakery. Um, and uh, I find it interesting since I move uh, back and forth between all these uh, areas of, of business that they have so many challenges in common. Uh, of course, as I said, the processes are typically more important than information. Safety is very important, uh, sometimes uh, even more so than security. Uh, but they also have the same reasons for failing, failing at technology uh, that are in many cases not due to technology. It's about mis misunderstandings, disputes, uh, differences in priorities and so on. Uh, and we put different meanings in words and that leads to misunderstandings. Uh, one special case uh, is that uh, more and more vendors use the word OT and the word IOT uh, interchangeably, uh, that they somehow mean the same thing. And uh, I don't agree with that. Uh, sure, there are some technology in common. There are security controls that are similar. Uh, they're getting closer together with the industry 4.0 and, and that, um, that movement. Uh, but it's not really about the technology, it's about what kind of problem you're trying to solve. And you have very different priorities. Uh, if you compare this steel mill in the background here to putting sensors in, in a waste paper basket, that's very different. You have very different priorities and very different risks. Um, Rob Lee said it very, uh, 
elegantly just uh, last week. Uh, there is a difference between using Alexa and running a gas turbine. Uh, and uh, we need to be careful about uh, how we present things and know that we have different priorities. In my mind, actually, IoT has more in common with, with IT. Uh, it's about, in many cases, collecting information and, and uh, doing that in a good way. Also, we have this whole discussion on IT-OT convergence, which is uh, a good thing in itself, but it's causing all sorts of problems and misunderstanding. Uh, one is that we're in sometimes talking about organizational convergence, and sometimes we're talking about technology, and we tend to confuse the two. And this is uh, where conflicts start when we talk about different things. So, um, why are so many organizations struggling uh, in their OT security efforts? Um, we see many uh, high profile security incidents as the result, uh, the last being uh, the US East Coast uh, pipeline. Um, and I'd like to offer some suggestions and some personal opinions uh, not related to technology but but uh, for for other sources um, when you do ot security you typically end up in something like this you you do need to do network segmentation you uh, try to segment from uh, corporate services down to operation operational services you segment uh, different sites and different workshops perhaps uh, and you realize that it's difficult to do segmentation uh, but even worse uh, it's it's even more difficult to do integration within this uh, segmented uh, world uh, and then if you look at your organization, you have something similar. You have corporate functions, you have corporate IT, corporate risk. Then you break it down into sites. You have site managers and various site uh, departments. Uh, typically, you have a site IT group that uh, works for the site manager. Um, and they have the same focus as their manager, of course, uh, keeping the site running and everything like that. And you start to see some friction. They see central IT having the wrong focus, uh, going after the wrong things, uh, being in the way. Uh, while the central functions get frustrated with the sites because they don't want to play ball when they come with uh, great security initiatives. And I think it's interesting if you overlay these two and you, you realize that they're, they're very similar. Uh, you have corporate functions at the top, you break it down in the same way. Um, and the irony really is that we're trying to add segmentation uh, to the picture in the left and we're uh, struggling and failing at it because we have too much segmentation in the picture at the right. Um, so if we are to be able to succeed in our in our integration and segmentation efforts in the network we need to remove a lot of segmentation on the right to to better work together between uh, groups in the organization and also between different organizations um, I don't have a perfect solution to offer you for this. Uh, I think the first step is really accepting that there is a problem. We do have different priorities. We, we see different things. Uh, and we need to be very careful how we express things. We use words differently. Things like risk, security, safety, secrecy. Uh, and we need to be very clear what we really mean. Uh, which leads us to these three letters. Uh, this is something you typically learn in whatever training you take in information security, confidentiality, integrity, availability. Uh, and if you do information security work, uh, you typically end up with confidentiality being the most important, keeping secrets, that's really important. Uh, 
And what happens when you take uh, information security guy and introduce him to OT? Well, they typically do something like this. Well, suddenly availability is more important, uh, which is true uh, in a sense. Uh, but typically uh, you stumble across the fact that in the first case, it's all about uh, keeping information secret. And in the latter, it's about keeping a physical process available and running. And that results in, in very different uh, ways of working. Of course, there are situations where there's secrets in OT, things like the manufacturing industry often have uh, recipes. And uh, also there's uh, situations where you need to balance uh, national security concerns and, and balance that uh, towards society availability and NIS directives uh, fallouts. Um, since this has been uh, unclear and some, some uh, source of discussion, people have started suggesting new words to describe priorities. Uh, these three uh, have been popular lately. Control, operate and observe. That is, uh, is our control system able to uh, keep our physical process under control? Are we as operators able to operate the, the physical process? And are we able to observe what happens in the physical process? Suddenly we have uh, a new way of describing our priorities and what we're trying to achieve, which is really great. Another suggestion that's uh, important or, or um, I should say uh, popular is safety, resilience and performance. Uh, are we creating a safe environment? Is the physical process resilient towards uh, some kind of external disturbance? And is the physical process running according to, to whatever uh, performance metrics uh, we have set up. Uh, and maybe the last year or so, there's been a, a heated debate actually over which of these groups of words uh, are the best to use for, for OT and OT security. Um, and if you ask me, uh, none of them, because we should use them all. Uh, all, all three versions are, are relevant and they can coexist. Uh, if we are to be really clear in what we mean, we need to use these words and, and be very explicit about what we are uh, trying to, to express. That way it's, uh, it's more easy to make IT and OT people uh, understand each other. Uh, while we have safety on the screen, uh, there's also this uh, potential conflict. Uh, safety and security, uh, two very uh, distinct concepts, although uh, linked. Uh, in some languages, like in Swedish, they translate into the same word, säkerhet, uh, which can seem like a, a stupid thing to, to get hung up on, but uh, I've actually seen several cases where they lead, this leads to misunderstandings and, and actually uh, work performed that uh, were no good in the end. Uh, something similar is uh, standards uh, for, for security management systems. Uh, most of you know ISO 27000, uh, classic information security management system standards. You assess information risks and you address them with security controls. Uh, 62443 is becoming the, the de facto standard uh, for OT, uh, where you assess risks for things like interruptions, accidents, environmental impacts, and you address them. Uh, I've seen cases where uh, people have tried using uh, uh, 27,000 to address and manage uh, OT security, and it uh, typically ends up uh, not working very well because it's, it's sort of a strained reasoning. In my mind, we can use these two together. They, they work perfectly together. Uh, I guess the only challenge is finding people um, uh, that know both. We're, we're, uh, there's not too many of us around uh, still. 
but we need to remember these have different ways of approaching things and it's in their DNA. It's, um, it's the way it's supposed to work. So what do I typically see at, at various customers? Uh, unfortunately, it's still common at some level that there's some kind of bad blood between OT and IT. Uh, they're, they're not talking to each other the way they should be. Typically that's related to a difference of priorities uh, for various reasons. OT, uh, uh, is often critiqued for using old technology, uh, which has its reasons. Uh, that's all um, um, often related to the, the, the long maintenance cycles in, in many OT environments. Uh, we have the myth of the air gap that we've mentioned before here today. And uh, luckily it's going away though, but it's, it's still there. Uh, and a very common problem is remote support. Uh, these days you cannot buy uh, a control system without also allowing the vendor to access it uh, remotely for, for uh, support and, and maintenance. So what do we do about all these? Uh, well, uh, I have colleagues in the business that uh, describe themselves as marriage counselors, that uh, the first thing they need to do is getting people to talk to each other uh, and create understanding between different groups. And there's uh, some truth to that actually. Uh, and the main thing there is really uh, making sure we're clear about the, our differences in priority. Uh, why are we trying to do different things? And also things like, what risks are we willing to take? Or do we agree on that? What's our risk appetite? Uh, do we have a common view of, of the threats that are uh, going after us? Old technology, uh, that's a problem that will not go away anytime soon in OT. Uh, Having said that, we still need to find supported solutions, especially for security purposes, uh, even though we're uh, basing our solution on non-supported technology, and that's, that's possible. Uh, the whole maintenance cycle, uh, if you cannot patch your systems more than uh, maybe once or twice each year, maybe you need to do something else uh, and focus your uh, efforts there instead. Uh, uh, there's also the whole uh, area of detection and knowing what happens in your system, which is important here, or even knowing what happened yesterday, which is a really difficult question to answer in many cases. Uh, the myth of the air gap. We need to find realistic solutions. I think Advenica has a big role to play here, of course. Uh, uh, and uh, just generally realizing that uh, we cannot uh, think about air gaps anymore. And of course, uh, similar remote support, we need to find solutions to control and manage uh, remote support uh, usage. And there's good solutions for that out and available as well. Uh, looking at all these, it's uh, the main uh, lesson really is that you need to respect the differences and you need to be very humble going into these situations because uh, you don't know everything and, and uh, you, you need to get people uh, who have their uh, worldview uh, talking to other people. So conclusions. Um, I chose this background picture, uh, the guy running on the treadmill uh, with, uh, since it's a great illustration, I think, of, of security work in many organizations. They, they are running, they are running the fastest they can, but they're really getting nowhere. And if they happen to slow down for a bit, they're, they're actually going backwards. Uh, so how do we start moving forward? And uh, again, this is about making groups of people work together making sure they understand each other and talk to each other, but also to benefit from 
uh, unexpected similarities between different sites or uh, even between different companies. Uh, there's a lot to learn from networking between uh, different lines of business. Uh, one thing that I think is important is that people tend to compare OT security with IT security. And uh, in my mind, if you do OT security properly anyway, you should really compare it to information security. You should start with the business requirements, understanding your business risks, then you do the security controls. You look at physical processes and the risk there instead of looking at the information, uh, instead of looking at lost information, you look at physical consequences, uh, lost production, hurting people, uh, environmental impacts. Uh, but it's the same basic approach. Uh, one area that's important, of course, is the whole digitalization of the environment. Uh, this is where we're uh, more and more tying our data flows together, which also means that we're integration, uh, we're integrating our risks. Uh, again, communication is everything, both on our networks and in the organization. And we should remember that segmentation is really the easy part. It's the integration that's difficult and that also goes for both networks and organizations. We should be very careful uh, always to describe why we're doing what we're doing, not only how. So that's it for me. Um, questions? Hey, thank you, Mats. Uh for a very inspiring um, session here. Uh, do we have any questions out there for Mats? Please write them in the chat. I have a question here. Uh, or, uh, what do you say, Mats? Uh, OT or IT? Who usually has the most uh, problem of, of um, cooperating together? Oh, it's an equal burden, I think. Um, I can't really blame one or the other. They're, okay. <laughs> they're, mo they're more different than they realize, but they have more in common than they know as well. They both uh, have the same big problem in cooperating then. Both sides, yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Okay, uh, any more questions to Mats? No, does not seem like it. Okay, thank you very thank you. much, uh, Mats, and uh, thank you all for listening in, in at this uh, session number two here at Avenica Insight today. And uh, this uh, session will now be ended. And for those of you who have uh, not joined yet, we have a new session starting at uh, um, one o'clock. So please uh, join that one on our on our website how you can join and we'll see you there bye bye